Good morning, Gateway Church. I hope that you had a great Thanksgiving celebration. Uh, we welcome you to the service this morning, and we hope that uh, you have a heart that is ready to celebrate the coming of Jesus Christ. Uh, we welcome Pastor Caleb Bunch of Redeeming Grace Fellowship back with us today for the third ser sermon in his series on Luke chapter 15. We learn now not about just the lost, but about the heart of the Father that is seeking the lost. And it's a great opportunity to see just what God is all about in Jesus Christ. Thank you for your participation in Operation Christmas Child. We collected over 62 boxes, which we've given to Samaritan's Purse, and they are on their way to helping children receive some hope and some uh, understanding of the gospel in the days ahead around the world. We also thank you for your continued support of Gateway Church. Uh, we appreciate everything that you can do. Um, if there is there's a box in the back of the church that you can place your offerings in, you can also send a check via your bank's bill pay, or you can send uh, a check directly to the church at 50 Walcott Road, Levittown, New York, 11756. Our prayer meeting is held Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock. You can join us both in person and or via Zoom, and we would welcome you to come. If you would like to be a part of the Zoom session, you need to make sure that the office has your email address and you can express your desire to be placed on the mailing list for the link for that meeting. Uh, we begin this morning with a word of prayer as we seek to honor our God through our worship and teaching time this week. Father, thank you for Thanksgiving, a time to pause and remember all that you've done for us. And Father, we do thank you for so much. We thank you for family. We thank you for the Church of Jesus Christ. We thank you for Jesus who redeemed us and saved us. We thank you, Father, for your provision of our needs. Father, we're aware that this pandemic has had its effect upon people. And for those in our church that have lost work or are in need of help, I pray, Father, that you would watch over them and care for them. May you be our strength for each one of us. We commit today to you, this time of teaching to you. And we pray, Father, that we would be with those that worship you. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. chapter 15. Today we find ourselves at the third of our four sermons covering the parables that are found in Luke chapter 15 about being lost and found. So far we've covered what it looks like to be lost as we saw in the parables of the sheep and the coin and then of course there was the shepherd and the woman who went after them. And then we examined what true repentance looks like by focusing our attention in on the prodigal son himself. But today, we're going to turn our focus on the heart of the Father in this story. So let's dive right into the text. For the sake of getting a full picture, I'm going to begin at the point of repentance in verse 11. I'm sorry, verse 17, rather. And then we will conclude at verse 24. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he rose and came to his father. Now here's our main focus for today. But while he was still a long way off, 
His father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate for this my son was dead. And is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Let's pray. Our Father, when you described yourself to Moses in Exodus chapter 33, you declare the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Lord, your love truly does abound to us. It is steadfast toward us. Lord, I ask that you would open our understanding to be more aware of your love today so that we might respond with love for you. For we do not love you out of our own innate goodness. We love you because you have loved us first. So Lord, I pray that you would allow the explanation of your word today to be instrumental in coloring in areas where our awareness of your love is dim. May your name be glorified through the proclamation and reception of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One of the greatest challenges that we have in understanding God is that we tend to assume that God is like us in ways that he is not like us. We imagine that he operates in the same way that we do, just bigger. We naturally perceive him to be some kind of a cosmic-sized version of whatever authority figures we have encountered in our lives. Teachers, parents, preachers, whatever. God condemned Israel for this kind of thinking. For example, in Psalm chapter 50, verse 12, he says, You thought... I was altogether like you. And then he goes on to correct their thinking. But there are also many ways that God is not like us. And one of the ways that we see a difference between him and us is in our emotions. Does God have emotions? Well, certainly he does. The scripture teaches us that he rejoices over us with singing. That just rejoices the word, action word for having joy. We see that he is angry with the wicked every day. We see that we can even grieve the Holy Spirit. We see that he laughs at the wicked, Psalm 2 and Psalm 37, verse 12. He describes himself as being jealous in Psalm 34, verse 44, and other places. And he is also saying that he is compassionate to care for those who are lost because he views them as sheep without a shepherd. But intrinsically in that statement, not just because of who they are, but he shows compassion because of who he is, a God merciful and compassionate. But God's emotions are not like our emotions. Our emotions are limited. We are limited by our finite knowledge, for example. God cannot be suspicious of anyone. When we talk about jealousy, we usually include in that some level of suspicion. God can't be suspicious because that would require that he doesn't know something. He knows everything. We are limited by our finite knowledge, which affects all of our emotions in various ways. So we fill in the blanks. And we make up our own mind and make many assumptions. But God's emotions, they're not like ours at all. We are limited. He is unlimited. Our emotions are also tainted by our sin nature in such a way that we will excuse the way we feel by declaring, well, I'm sorry, I was just having a bad day. I wouldn't normally say that to you. I was just hungry. Or maybe I did that because they provoked me. Or you know, that's not really who I am. I I don't normally do that kind of thing. That's not me. Or on the alternative side, they could say, that's just who I am. They have to deal with it. But God's emotions are fully informed. And more than that, they are completely untainted by sin. And God's emotions, unlike ours, never change. He is not flippant. He does not fly off the handle. He is never careless in his responses. He is always operating out of a holy and just framework. So he says in Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, he says these words, I, the Lord, do not change. That is why you descendants of Jacob are not already destroyed. 
Do you get his point here? He is saying, you should be very happy that I, God, do not change, because if I did, you would all be dead. So what's my point? I want us to recognize the unchanging, unlimited, unfading love of God that we see in this parable. But in doing so, I want us to be very careful not to project ourselves onto the father character in this story. The point of the story is that he is not like you. So before dissecting the text, let's first identify who Jesus is talking to, talking about rather, when he speaks of this father figure. It can be a little confusing when you read through these parables because what will often happen, I think, with people is this. They will read the three parables and they will infer Trinitarian attributes that are not actually present. And here's what I mean. They see the shepherd and they say, well, Jesus, of course, says he's the good shepherd. That's Jesus. And then they will see the father in the third story and they'll say, well, of course, God the father is the father. So clearly this is speaking of God the father. And then they will question, wait a minute, what about that other one, the woman who searches out the coin? Is that the Holy Spirit? Well, let me give you the answer. The answer is both yes and no. You see, God is never represented as a woman in the scripture, and this is true in this case as well. Jesus is not giving us a theological, systematic theology of a step-by-step process of the ordo salutis here. He is giving you a very simple parabolic image of salvation. He is not assigning various roles and actions to the three different persons of the Godhead. Each one of these figures, the shepherd, the woman, and the father, all of them represent all three of the members of the Trinity. Although the three persons have different roles and functions in the process of salvation, they all have the same heart. The Trinity is perfectly unified, both in character and in purpose. So again, what in the world is my point? Simply this. Some people view God, the Father, to be some kind of a cranky, grumpy, angry, vengeful God, and they will view Jesus, the Son, as some kind of a joyful, merciful, compassionate, inviting figure, right? Or maybe they will break up their understanding of God chronologically, and they will say, the God of the Old Testament was a God of brutality and judgmentalism, and he was off-putting, whereas the God of the New Testament is gentle and understanding and welcoming, and they will divide their comprehension of God in such a way that they misunderstand that the heart of God is unchanging. He is angry with the wicked every day, as we have already mentioned, but he is also always a God of mercy. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit are united and perfectly unified in their unchanging attributes. Their character traits are not divided between them. The father does not excel in any ways that the son does not and vice versa. So too is true with the Holy Spirit. So how should we view the father figure in this passage? The father represents the whole of the Trinity. It is the heart of God, the father and God, the son and God, the spirit. He displays in this this parable the unchanging, unlimited, unfading love of God in our undivided Godhead. So as we walk through this passage, you are supposed to identify yourself as the prodigal son, and you are to view the Father as our triune God. The point that Jesus is making here is very simple. It does not take a genius to comprehend Jesus' message, that God loves sinners. That's the point. He does not merely tolerate us. He doesn't begrudgingly accept us. He delights in us. The way that we are going to get a better view of this love that God has for us is to break down four specific phrases that exist in this part of the parable. Let's first examine this phrase. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion. Imagine a first century Middle Eastern plantation. There would have been one large home, and that's where the father would live. But right outside, there would be many other outbuildings where his children would have their own home, where they were uh, expected to start their own families and to begin building up in their area of the courtyard. There would also be dozens of smaller houses occupied by people that were employed to care for the house. The prodigal son has already referred to these people in this story multiple times as hired servants. 
The prodigal son was walking down this very familiar dirt path in his own home, and he is walking back towards his home, wondering how in the world is the father going to respond to my confession of sin? Now, this guy, he's probably rehearsing over and over and over the lines that he wants to get out, knowing he's going to have a difficult time saying them because he might break into tears. He's trying to make sure he's he's able to say exactly the right things because he knows this is his only hope. If this fails, he's got nowhere else to turn. But before he even sees the father, the father spots him. When he was still very far off, his father saw and felt compassion. And his father's eye was trained on that horizon, observing this tiny little speck crest that hill. And he knew exactly who it was from that distance. And he got up and he ran towards him, showing pity on him. Now, if you're a Christian, that is your story as well. But just how far off were you when God saw you? Let's briefly examine this using the most common biblical metaphor that exists for our lostness. It's actually also present here in this text. You'll notice at the very bottom of what the father says, he declares, this my son was dead and is now alive. Let's take that metaphor of death being brought to life and bring it to another passage of scripture, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Here it says, And you, yes, believer, he's talking to Christians, You were dead in the trespasses and sins in in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. That pretty much defines this prodigal son, does it not? Verse 4, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. His eye was set on us. His affection was given to us when we were still far off. Romans chapter five, verse eight, parents, is a great verse to memorize around your kitchen table with your kids. It will be so encouraging to hear them say these words and to recognize and realize and to hide in their heart this truth that God shows his love for us that in yet while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You were not just cresting a hill when God saw you and had compassion for you. You were spiritually dead. Now, let's just for a moment acknowledge the fact that this imagery can seem like we were morally neutral. Being dead means we don't do anything, right? So it appears as though we're morally neutral because dead people are morally neutral people. But what this is speaking to is not our morality. It's speaking to our inability. Being dead speaks about the, the fact that we can't do anything to make the relationship correct. We cannot bring ourselves to life. But it doesn't mean that we were moral people. In fact, the scripture tells us in James 4 that we were referred to as enemies of God. Romans chapter 5 verse 6 tells us that Christ died for the ungodly. Think of this. We were dead in our sins, enemies of God, and the only word that could be used to describe us is a word that literally means the opposite of God himself. We are ungodly. That's you and that's me. That's how far away we were when God saw us and had compassion on us. The father's love for the prodigal son never diminished, no matter how far away he was. The love that he had for him never changed while he was in that far country. He loved the wandering son the entire time. His eyes were glued on that horizon, awaiting the day when he would see him once again. Which brings us now to our second phrase that reveals the heart of God in this parable. And he ran to him, embraced him, and kissed him. Now, at first glance, we see the urgency of the father's actions. We see the outpouring of affection that we would expect to see from a loving father to a son who he has not seen for a time. But this seemingly simple line bears with it the incredible cultural meaning that could easily be overlooked. We don't live in a shame culture. We don't live in a honor code system here in the United States. If you are 
from a cultural background that has more of a honor and shame code, then you will know more of what I'm speaking about. If you've ever had the opportunity to visit a culture that has more of an honor shame code, you will know what I'm talking about. But what I am speaking to here is the fact that in our country, we have shifted very far away, probably too far away, from what it looks like to have honor and shame. People can't even feel shame anymore for a lot of the things that they do. People will dress and speak however they want. And as Americans, we have this hyper-independent streak that causes us to regularly say, whether verbally or non-verbally, I just don't care what you think about me. Well, that concept would have been absolutely foreign to these people hearing the parable initially. These people care deeply about their reputation. They prized their reputation above almost anything, and there were many ways that somebody could shame themselves by their actions. Let me just tell you, rich people run. Most of them do. I mean, the, the most successful, wealthy people that exist right now, they run, but they do it in a private room in their house with no cameras where they are on a treadmill and there is no public observing them. We don't often get Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates and Oprah running together in a 100K foot race, right? You don't see that often because rich people don't run publicly, even to this day. In Jewish society, running was for servants, it was for the lowest on the totem pole. Running brought shame to the rich. Leaders were actually expected to practice their walk. They called it, you know, the old word for it is your gait, right? Practice your gait as you're walking. And we actually have documentation from this time period, not only for the Jews, but also pretty much everybody in the Roman Empire. It's a holdover from Greek culture that was permeating that part of the world that when you walked, they, the wealthy people would practice walking in such a way that it appeared as they were, though they were gliding, that their shoulders never moved up and down, that their head never bobbed back and forth. It was an old-fashioned version of swagger. You wanted to look like you were floating across the earth. So the long robes would obscure your feet. They wouldn't see you moving. You would just seem to float into the room. And people would practice this. So for the father to operate in this way is very surprising. He has no swagger in this moment. He saw his son and he ran with full abandon, not caring about his reputation at all. He gathered up all of those flowing robes, showing off his legs to them, his old rubbery legs to all the people who might be observing. And he sprinted as fast as he could toward the gates. And when he arrived at this son, he threw his arms around him and embraced him and kissed him. Sin brings shame. All the way back to the Garden of Eden, we see that Adam and Eve were ashamed of their sin. They sin, and all of a sudden they realize, wait a second, like God doesn't even have to speak to them before they realize, whoa, what is going on here? We're naked. Well, they were always naked, but now they figure this out all of a sudden? What is going on here? Because there is now shame associated so much so internally that it reveals itself even externally as they are ashamed of who they are before one another. Because of their sin, they realized their nakedness. And when God disciplined them, he removed them from the garden. And then we see God do something very amazing. He takes the very first life. He kills an animal and he takes the skin and covers them as a picture of covering their shame. Uh, that's a foreshadowing of the gospel. In a very similar way, this prodigal son had much to be ashamed about. I mean, think about it. He treated his family like garbage. He wished for his father to die. He had run away and lived a scandalous lifestyle in a foreign country that the Jewish people would have abhorred. And he squandered everything, all this money that he had been given. He wasted it all. If he would have walked back into that compound, into that plantation, and he walked through those gates, every single person who saw him, other than the father, would have mocked him. Oh, look at this kid. Look who's back. That skinny, starving, ungrateful fool. He's getting exactly what he deserves. They would have cheered in their hearts as they saw his comeuppance, as they saw him getting exactly what they thought was coming to him. In fact, one scholar that I read actually said the custom of the day would have been for the son to be disavowed and unallowed to come into the gates. He would be required by the father to sit outside the gates for several days, accepting nothing from inside. 
he would sit there in the heat or in the cold, and he would have no food or no water. He would sit there so that everyone who walked in could mock him and see the father's displeasure with him. It was a way for the father to say, I am disgusted with this son of mine. I want nothing to do with those actions that he performed. I am displeased, disappointed, and dishonored. And so the more days he would sit there, the more frustrated it meant the father must be with him. It was a way that they would make this person look small. Here's where we see the cross of Jesus Christ in the parable. Consider Jesus, the God of heaven, seated on the throne, being worshipped by angels. And then, the very next moment, he is a zygote clinging to the uterine wall of a teenage girl. He went from being surrounded by wealth unimaginable to a lifestyle of poverty. He says the birds have nests and foxes have dens, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He went from being sought out and worshipped by angels to being sought out to be killed by Herod. He went from a place of absolute purity and righteousness, unstained, to being surrounded by the slime and filth that permeates our world. And you would think... That somebody this beautiful in terms of his character and nature would have stood out amongst the filth of this world, like a diamond in a pit of mud. But instead of being prized as the treasure that he is, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. His disciples, who did realize at least a portion of his glory, thought, well, you know what he's going to do is go into Jerusalem. He's going to kick the Romans out. He's going to take up the throne, and he's going to rule here on earth. But instead, he was not taken inside and elevated. He was taken outside the walls and elevated onto a cross where he was crucified and where he hung in agony and where he had his clothes stripped away, where Adam and Eve had been covered by God. God himself was uncovered by man. And they sold his clothes by gambling for them at the foot of the cross. And publicly they scorned him and made jokes at his expense. And when Jesus said, I thirst, what did they give him? They gave him a a sponge filled with vinegar. Jesus gave no thought to his reputation. He hung there humiliated for the world to see. And why? Why did he do this? Hebrews 12 tells us that it was for the joy set before him that he endured the cross, despising the shame or thinking nothing of the shame. He clothed himself in your shame, in my shame, so that he might clothe us in glory. The Pharisees who heard this parable, when they heard this story, they would have looked down on the father in the story. Who does he think he is? What kind of a father is that? What kind of a man is that that would just pull his, his robe up around his legs and run like that? What kind of father is that that would go outside of the gates of his own plantation and welcome that child home? What kind of father are are we talking about here? But you know what? It's not surprising because these very same Pharisees are the ones who when they recognized Jesus was at the cross and they saw the shame of that, they thought little of him and mocked him. There's this amazing picture in this story of God laying down his own reputation for his people. One of the greatest joys of being a Christian is that we no longer have to bear the weight of shame. And because our sin has been washed away and uh, the blood of Jesus Christ has covered us, we also can eliminate the guilt that accompanies it. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Imagine how surprised the son must have been to receive that embrace from his father. He sees his dad running towards him. He realizes this conversation that I was practicing in my mind is going to happen a lot faster than I expected. And when his father's coming, he doesn't know if his father's going to punch him in the face or scream at him. How shocked do you think he was when he saw his father with tears running down his face, throw his arms around him and and embrace him? He must have been overwhelmingly surprised at what the father is doing. We see that the son begins this spiel that he had been rehearsing, but he can't even finish it. He doesn't even get halfway before the father interrupts him and says, here we have our third phrase of the day, bring quickly. Now we're going to pause here and focus on these words and the things that he tells them to bring. The father does not simply say to the son, sure, you know what? You can be one of my servants. Great. You'll eat at their table. No, he he brings him back as a full standing son. And he signifies his acceptance of his son by saying, bring quickly these following items. First, he says, bring him the best robe. This one, of all the things he says to bring, may be the most surprising to those who are listening. 
And you and I have access to clothes, so we don't think about this very often. You go to Kohl's or Target or who knows where, and you, you purchase clothes that have a tag that says made in Thailand. But in reality, in Thailand, they're not even made by people. They're made by a machine, and they're only inspected by a person. And those clothes are made with materials that were produced in a farm far away from even those people. So our product, the things that you are wearing right now, you have no concept of where those materials even arrived from. Several years ago, I opened a Christmas gift. Some of you have heard this before. I said this several years ago when I received it. I got a gift from my wife's grandmother. Uh, They own a farm over in Oregon, and uh, she sent me a pair of socks for Christmas. And when I opened it, I didn't think anything of it. I mean, it it was nice, but I didn't think much about it. And then I read the note that came with it, which spoke about how she had taken wool from their own sheep. She had produced it. She had dyed it, this green color. And then she had personally knit these socks together for me. That made a big difference in my understanding of the value of those socks. These were not 99 cent socks from Target. These were personalized, handmade, crafted and developed with hard work and intensive labor as a kind gift to me. What a gift. And those were just socks. Here he says, bring a robe to this boy. In Jesus' day, even the wealthiest people had small closets. And here in this setting, the father would have only owned a few pairs of clothes. And in this case, when he says, bring the best robe, you need to understand the best robe was reserved for the father in the house. This would have been the clothes the father would typically be buried in. This is not to be shared. This is the highest honor that he can give is to say, let me give you my best. And is that not what God the Father has done for us? He has given us his best. He gave us his son. Jesus Christ has given us himself. When you become a Christian, you receive many gifts. But the greatest gift is that you have personal relationship with the God of the universe. That he has given you many things, but most and first and foremost, himself. God gives his best. This is not what the boy would normally inherit. This is the suit that his father said is the most precious and valuable. And that, he says, give to him. And here we see that his needs are also met. As the father says, I see your feet. I see that they're bleeding and crusty from your long walk from that far country. And he says, bring sandals and put them on his feet. In, in, in similar manner, we see that God the father provides for his people. We see that don't worry about these things, for the father in heaven knows that you need them. So pray to the Lord. If you need Pray to the Lord. He loves you. He provides. And we also see that he is given a ring to wear on his finger. So the father is not just meeting his needs. He's actually going far beyond that. Now, I'm sorry to say this, ladies. But nobody needs jewelry. You don't need jewelry. Husbands, take that to heart. Uh, don't kill me, ladies. You don't need it. You don't need jewelry. And in those days, wedding rings didn't exist. This was not a symbol of marriage in, in that custom. They didn't comprehend the idea of wearing this to give evidence of your commitment to an individual. No, what did they mean? Rings were a display of status and wealth. And this father demands that his son be well arrayed, royally displaying his authority. God blesses us in ways that are far more abundant and above than ways that we naturally think. Not always in ways that we expect, definitely not in all the ways that we ask for, but always in the ways that are best for us. God blesses us immensely. And then they bring out the fatted calf to prepare it for the feast. Now this was a really big deal. Imagine what this means. The fatted calf was the one animal that they set aside And they gave it all the table scraps all year round, trying to bloat this thing. And of course, he's having the best life that he could possibly have, this cow. And he's just consuming food all the time. And they do that for the express purpose of saying, this is going to be the most important meal that we have all year long. We are going to celebrate. So imagine like your Christmas dinner or Thanksgiving. And all of a sudden, the boy comes home and you say, forget it. Christmas dinner is today. Go get all the food. We are cooking until tonight. We are celebrating now. We will not wait. Here the father calls an audible and says, we kill that fatted calf now. Last time we were together, I gave you the definition of the word prodigal. The word means to spend lavishly, freely, or extravagantly 
without thought or care of the cost. So now we see that there are actually two prodigals in this story. We have the prodigal son who squandered his wealth in reckless living, but we also have the prodigal father who spent, who poured out undeserved blessings on his son. He spent lavishly, freely, and extravagantly without care of the cost. The love of God is boundless and free. All who come to him in repentance are received in this same way. Why are there parties in heaven when people repent? It's because God himself celebrates. He rejoices when sinners come home. He says in verse 24, For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Brothers and sisters, if you were daily, hourly reminded of God's love for you, it would drastically alter your life. Knowing that you are loved is the greatest deterrent to falling into sin. As Jesus taught, he who is forgiven much loves much. Our God is a prodigal God who has given grace that is greater than all of our sin. He is the one who has poured out lavishly on us to give us all of the mercy that we do not deserve. Hear the kindness of Jesus' command when he says, Abide in my love in John 15. Be in awe that your Savior, Savior who bore your sin and shame loves you. And if there's anyone here who is in the room who is still a prodigal son, someone who is far from the Lord, somebody who is still in that far country, please know that this is the reception that is available for anyone who turns and repents. He will never turn away anyone who comes to him for forgiveness. If there is genuine repentance, there will always be genuine forgiveness. So allow me now to close with this precious verse. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called sons of God. But don't miss that last phrase. And so we are. Not just that we are called to be sons of God. Not just that we give the name. It's not just a verbalization, but that we are, this ontological truth, the fact, the verb, we are, we have become children of God. If you are a Christian, he is telling you, you are my family. You have been adopted into being my child. That is one of the most precious and most phenomenal things that you could ever hear or believe. Let's pray. Father God, we just ask that in all of these things we have heard, you would impress upon us more genuinely the nature of your abundant love. And in doing so, that we would see your kindness so clearly towards us that we would never cease to praise. Lord, we just ask that in all of this, you would open our eyes further so that we might follow after you more carefully. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.